This is going to be our fifth lecture in Module 2. In this lecture, we're going to be covering bonding as it applies to Article 250. Our objectives for this lecture, we're going to identify NEC requirements for bonding of equipment, list bonding methods for services, and use Table 250.102C1 to size conductors. We've referenced this table quite a few times in previous lectures. We're finally going to be taking a look at it. Our definitions. Bonded or bonding means connected to establish electrical continuity and conductivity. Uh, this is a term I mentioned before in a previous lecture that I'd be pretty harsh on definitions in this module. Uh, this is a perfect example of why uh, the term bonded gets replaced with grounded uh, quite a lot. You'll often hear you know, that you need to ground a metallic enclosure or ground a raceway when in reality what you're doing is you are bonding that enclosure or that raceway to the grounding system. Often a bit of confusion there. And inner system bonding termination, a device that provides a means for connecting inner system bonding conductors for communication systems to the grounding electrode system. This is a big fancy sounding a term and a big complicated sounding definition. Essentially, a inner system bonding termination is a device that we install on the grounding electrode uh, system so that communication systems can bond to the grounding electrode system is the simple definition. Starting off here, we're going to be taking a look at Article 250, Part 5, Bonding. Part 5 covers bonding requirements for different locations in the electrical system and for different pieces of equipment. So depending on where we're at in the electrical system, you know, whether we're at the service or branch circuit, and depending on what type, if we're working on different pieces of equipment, we have different rules in regards to bonding requirements. Bonding must be provided where needed to maintain electrical continuity and conduct any fault current that may be imposed. So way back in our first lecture, we went over the five requirements that we, ha that we need to meet in terms of grounding a system. Uh, two of those points were, one, to maintain continuity of all non normally non-current carrying metal parts of the system, and in order to give a low impedance uh, path back to overcurrent protected devices. We accomplish that by means of bonding. So starting off at our equipment bonding, we're going to start at the electrical service, at the service equipment. Kind of a logical place to start at. Normally, non-current carrying parts of the following must be bonded together. All raceways, cable trays, gutters, etc. that contain or enclose service conductors unless otherwise permitted by 250.80 all enclosures that contain service con uh, sorry, and all s enclosures that contain service conductors. In other words, unless it's accepted by 250.80, uh, if some type of metallic raceway or enclosure contains service conductors, all of those have to be bonded together. Uh, and to that, we have different methods by which we can accomplish that. So bonding jumpers must be used for oversized washers and oversized knockouts. Standard lock nuts and bushings cannot be the only means of bonding. Continuity must be ensured by one of the following means. <laughs> so in other words, for any time we're using oversized washers or oversized knockouts on a piece of equipment, we have to use some type of bonding jumper. Uh, in that situation, we can't use standard lock nuts and bushings. Uh, we have to use uh, one of these methods described in 250.92b. Bonding equi equipment to the service conductor in a way per, per 250.8. The use of threaded couplings or connectors that are wrenched tight. And threadless coupling and connectors made up tight when used with metal raceway and metal clad cable. So these are the methods we have to follow when we run into that situation. And if, as we typically see other listed means. So here's some examples of those items. So you can see here on the left, we have a uh, threaded coupling and we have a bonding lock nut. 
Here on the right, we have some bonding bushings that are being used to bond uh, these raceways and these enclosures, these conductors. Sticking with equipment bonding, we're gonna be taking a look at our communication systems. Communica communications systems bonding must be connected per 250.94A or B. So we have uh, two options here. Part A, an inner system bonding termination device, which we talked about earlier, gave a de definition of. And 250.94 simply is other means. And this would obviously be other listed or approved means. But typically, you're going to be using an inner system bonding termination device. Sticking with communication systems, an inner system bonding termination device must be provided externally to service enclosures and disconnected. Connecting means it must comply with all the following. Must be accessible, must have enough terminals for connection of at least three conductors, must not interfere with the opening of other equipment, and it must be securely mounted and connected to a service equipment enclosure slash disconnecting means or be mounted at the enclosure and connected to it or the grounding electroconductor with a minimum 6AWG conductor. So in other words, we have to have a inter system bonding termination device at the service. It has to have at least, it has to have enough terminals for at least three conductors, can interfere with other equipment opening, and has to be mounted or connected directly to the equipment enclosure or the disconnecting means, or it must be connected to it using a grounding electroconductor. And the terminals must be listed as grounding and bonding equipment. In other words, we can't just use any old uh, bar for this. It has to be specifically listed for the purpose. Aside from our service enclosures, we're going to talk about other enclosures here. Electri electrical equipment to be used as an equipment grounding conductor must be bonded where needed to ensure continuity. Remember, we always have to have these parts all bonded together. Non-conductive surfaces must be removed or fittings designed for coatings must be used. We talked about this rule previously as well. For circuits over 250 volts to ground, raceway and metal cable sheaths must use one of the methods in 250.92B other than B1. We talked about those options before uh, when we're talking about service equipment, but here we see for circuits over 250 volts to ground, we have an additional, we have to follow those methods as well. Talking about our supply side bonding jumper, we talked about this back in our uh, lecture on separately derived systems. Supply side bonding jumpers cannot be smaller than as shown in table 250.102C1. We've talked about this table on several different instances so far through this module. <coughs> Where parallel ungrounded conductors are used in multiple raceways and individual bonding jumpers are used for each raceway, the bonding jumper size must be based on the conductor in each raceway. So in other words, we have multiple uh, raceways with multiple ungrounded conductors. The bonding jumper has to be sized per those conductors in each raceway. We can't base both the bonding jumpers or all the bonding jumpers on just one conductor size. Where a single bonding jumper is used for multiple raceways, it must comply with 250.102C1. And here is our table 250.102C1. So we can see up here that this is to be used for grounded conductors, main bonding jumpers, system bonding jumpers, and supply side bonding jumpers for alternating current systems. And this is going to work exactly as our table 250.66 worked. On the left-hand side here, we see the size of the largest ungrounded conductor equivalent area for parallel conductors. And on our right-hand column, we see size of the grounded conductor or bonding jumper. Once again, depending on the size of the conductor on the left, we're just gonna go straight across and pick out our conductor on the right-hand column. Like I said, this works exactly the same as 250.66, so revisit that part of that lecture if you need a refresher on this. And we have other system bonding. We're going to be taking a look at water piping. Metal water piping must be bonded per 250.104A1 through 3. Now, if you remember in our lecture about grounding electrodes, we said that metal water piping, if it's in direct contact with the earth for 10 feet, can be used as a grounding electrode. But if for whatever reason, 
regardless of whether we use it as a grounding electrode or not, we still have to bond that metal water pipe, regardless of that. And it has to meet 250.104 A1 through 3. A1, water piping installed in a structure must be bonded to either the service equipment enclosure, the grounded conductor at the service, the grounding electrode conductor, or a grounding electrode. So once again, regardless of whether we're using it as a grounding electrode or not, it still has to be bonded. Essentially, what you can boil this down to is the grounding electrode system. However, it may not be a grounding electrode, depending on how it's installed. A2, in a multiple occupancy building, the pipe may be attached to the grounding terminal of the equipment supplying the occupancy where the pipe is metallically isolated from other occupancies. In other words, if we have a water pipe in a multi-occupancy building, so if we think about maybe a, a mall, for example, if we just have one store in that mall that is supplied by a metal water pipe, we can connect it to the uh, grounding terminal of the equipment that supplies that occupancy, assuming that water pipe doesn't connect to any other of the occupancies. And A3, for building supplied by a feeder or a branch circuit, the water pipe must be bonded to either the building disconnect enclosure, the equipment grounding conductor, or a grounding electrode. And aside from water piping, we also have other metal piping. Other metal piping systems, including gas piping that is likely to become energized, must be bonded to one of the following. So as I mentioned in our grounding electrode lecture with gas pipe, we cannot use gas pipe as a grounding electrode. However, we are required to bond to it. And the idea of this is that if that gas pipe, if current, a current carrying conductor makes accidental contact with that gas pipe, we want to open the overcurrent protected device that is, per, that is upstream of those current carrying conductors connecting to that gas pipe. And the only way we can do that is if from that gas pipe, we provide that low impedance return path for that current. Remember, the main reason we do grounding and bonding is for that low impedance path. Otherwise, if we didn't do that, then that gas pipe would become electrically energized and current carrying. Uh, so, but back to this, must be bonded by one of the following means. The equipment grounding conductor of the circuit that may energize it, the service equipment enclosure, the grounded conductor at the service, the grounding electrode conductor, or a grounding electrode. The bonding conductor or equipment grounding conductor must be sized per table 250.122. So, all these are pretty self-explanatory. Um, we'll say, so for example, on the equipment grounding conductor of the circuit that may energize it, if you think about a uh, natural gas range in a dwelling, for example, those often have an electric pilot light installed, so you can just walk up to them, turn a knob, and turn and ignite the gas. That's typically going to be fed by a branch circuit of the electrical system. So you would, as it would be f fairly likely that in a a typical situation that circuit could energize the gas pipe, you could use the equipment grounding conductor of that pilot light cir circuit to bond to that gas pipe. Here we have structural metal. Exposed structural metal that is connected to form a, a metal building frame that is not intentionally grounded or bonded and is likely to become energized must be bonded using one of the following methods. So once again, we can use structural metal steel as a grounding electrode, but in the event for whatever reason we don't use it, you know, maybe it's not in direct contact with the earth, earth enough to count, we still have to bond it. So we can use the service equipment enclosure, the grounded conductor at the service, the disconnecting means for a building supplied by a feeder or branch circuit, or the grounding electrode conductor, or a grounding electrode. And that concludes this lecture. In our next session, we're going to be talking about equipment grounding conductors, and that will conclude the lectures for Module 2.